Good afternoon. Welcome everyone to the Georgia Tech Manufacturing Institute's Fall Lunch and Learn Lecture Series. My name is Billy D. Brown. I'm a research faculty and director of manufacturing education programs at Georgia Tech Manufacturing Institute, or GTMI. GTMI is one of 11 Georgia Tech interdisciplinary research institutes that uniquely focuses on manufacturing research development and deployment. We help tackle the grand challenges of today's manufacturers and assist partners in moving innovations from the lab to the market. GTMI has a wide variety of facilities um, and equipment located on main campus for basic research and nearby on 14th Street for more applied research in our advanced manufacturing pilot facility. GTMI's mission includes education and workforce training, collaborative partnerships with industry, academia, and government, as well as thought leadership. GTMI hosts a lunch and learn series each semester. This fall sessions will be held on Mondays at noon as live online events. These sessions are excellent opportunities for Georgia Tech faculty, undergraduate and graduate level students and researchers, as well as a global manufacturing community to learn and share advanced manufacturing knowledge. To ensure a smooth presentation experience, all audience members are automatically muted. Uh, if you have questions or comments for the speaker, please go ahead and submit them in the Q&A panel um, as soon as you have them formulated. Um, and then the speaker will address the questions at the end, at the end of the talk. Today, I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Surab Saha, who will discuss high throughput nanoscale additive manufacturing. Dr. Surab Saha is an assistant professor in the GW Woodruff School of Mechanical Engineering at Georgia Tech. He joined Georgia Tech in 2019 after a four year stay at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, where he first worked as a postdoctoral researcher and then as a research engineer. He received his PhD uh, in mechanical engineering from MIT in 2014 and his master's and bachelor's in mechanical engineering from the Indian Institute of Technology, Kanpur, Kanpur in 2008. His research interest lies in scaling up advanced manufacturing processes, especially for generation of complex micro and nanoscale 3D structures. His work on nanoscale 3D printing has increased the processing rate by up to a thousand times while printing the thinnest of nanowires. Uh, this work was published in science and has been recognized with the Federal Laboratory Consortium Far West Regional Outstanding Technology Development Award. In today's uh, session, uh, Dr. Saha will discuss the development of a high throughput nanoscale additive manufacturing technique based on parallelization of two photon lithography. Dr. Saha's technique has increased the processing rate by a thousand times while preserving nanoscale feature sizes and geometric complexity, breaking the traditional trade-off between rate and feature size, a trade-off that has persisted in the field for more than two decades and was considered unbreakable. Welcome, Dr. Saha. You may begin your presentation. Thank you, Billini, for the introduction. And thank you all for having me here. So what I'm going to talk about today is additive manufacturing on a nanoscale. And additive manufacturing has been receiving a lot of attention over the past decades or so, past several decades. But nanoscale additive manufacturing has remained a niche technique. And the major issue with that technique has been the throughput of the process or the rate at which, to, at which we do the printing on the nanoscale. And what we have been working on over the past few years is actually scaling up the process to a point that we can make functional structures using nanoscale additive manufacturing. And what I'm going to do today is talk about how did we get to a point where we can scale up to, a, to an extent that it becomes feasible to make functional structure. And if you look at nanoscalarity manufacturing, there has been a lot of interest for the past 10 years or so in terms of making functional structures. And the reason for that is going to this scale enables new functions. And on the left-hand side, we, I have two examples, and on the right-hand side, two examples on the device side. If you look on the left-hand side, these are structures or metamaterials that were fabricated using nanoscale 3D printing. And what these metamaterials do is they have properties 
superior to those of natural materials. And we get those properties by structuring on a nanoscale or making features which are very, very small. And the smallest features that we could get are on the order of a few hundred nanometers, even up to 100 nanometer wide. And we can make 3D structures out of those nanoscale features up to several millimeters large in all three dimensions. And the top image here is a gridded density foam. The bottom one is an architectural material with a, with a strength which approaches that of the theoretical limit. And the gridded density foam that was used in an application for controlling how pressure waves move through a material to study the conditions in the center of planets, high temperatures and high pressure experiments. Whereas on the right, these are devices which were fabricated using these techniques. And we were able to make, or other researchers were able to make these kind of devices because the features are on the nanoscale. So if you have devices on the 70 or 50 micron scale, you would want features on several, at least one tenth to 100 times smaller to be able to make optical surfaces or very smooth surfaces. And what's common across all of these applications is they were all fabricated using the same technique, which is the two photon lithography technique. And what this technique is, is it takes a laser beam and scans the laser beam in space. And what happens at the focus of the laser beam is that a material, a photopolymer material, gets converted into a solid material. So there is curing of material. And what we are left with is a 3D structure inside the liquid photopolymer. And once the process is complete, what, what we would do is wash away or dissolve the unpolymerized material, and we are left with, these, with this 3D structure with very small features. So overall, this process looks very similar to optical 3D printing in terms of the elements that we have. So we have a laser, we focus the laser inside a photopolymer, and we are left with a 3D structure. But where this differs from other optical techniques is that the features are very, very small. And we can actually get features smaller than the spot of light that's used to make that feature. And later on, I'm going to discuss how do we actually get these very small sub-diffraction features. But what we can do with this technique is now print very large structures on a millimeter scale with these very small features on a nanoscale. And we printed something very, what we have printed has been on the scale of less than a 150, less than 150 nanometers in width, a few hundred nanometers in depth, and we can then scan it in space to make large 3D structures. Now, in terms of manufacturing, so being able to make actual 3D structures, if you look at the performance of this process, the two for done lithography process, relative to other 3D printing processes, what we see is this trade-off between feature size and the rate or tripper. So if you look at optical 3D printing technique, projection microstereolithography is a very common one that's used today for making 3D structures. And that is at least 10,000 times faster than scanning a point in space and making sub-diffraction features. But at the same time, those techniques have poor resolution relative to this technique. So if you want to actually get to a point where we make very large structures, but with very small features, because that's what our functional requirements are, we don't have a lot of choice. We either need to improve the rate, the rate of two photon lithography, or we need to improve the resolution of other 3D printing techniques. Now, this is where physics comes in. And for other processes, it's just not possible to get very small features because of the diffraction limit. You can make features only as small as the light spot. Whereas in two photon lithography, we can actually make sub diffraction features. So, what we did is we looked at the two photon lithography process to actually increase the overall rate and at the same time maintain the feature size to those sub diffraction 100 nanometer features. And the red star right here is, this, is what we did in the past in terms of increasing the rate by a thousand times. At the same time, maintaining the smallest features, there's still room for improvement. And what I'm going to talk about today is identify how we actually got there and what kind of room do we have in terms of improvement. And in terms of improvement for manufacturing metrics of two-photon lithography, 
The major one is throughput. And before we did our work, most of printing was done using these serial sequential point by point writing techniques, which took a lot of time to print a 3D structure. The millimeter cube would take up to 10 hours to 100 hours, depending on the density of material in that 3D structure. At the same time, helping out with this throughput are issues of materials, is can you make these, with, make these 3D structures with the materials that you want? And can you actually predictively control printing because you know enough about the process to do predictive fabrication? Where we were in the past was we were at very low throughput, very limited knowledge about the process, and very limited material set. And today I'm going to talk mostly about throughput, how we increase the throughput by a thousand times, but also look at the process knowledge and materials from the perspective of throughput, is what kind of knowledge do we need and materials to push it to a high, high speed printing. And very quick preview of what we did is when we started scaling up this two for down lithography, we looked at all other attempts that had been made to increase the overall throughput. And what we saw is this trade off between throughput and resolution. So a lot of researchers had tried out before us to scale up two for down lithography. They were successful in increasing the throughput, but where they failed is, in, is getting those very small features at very high rates. And our work actually broke this trade off to a point where we can make very, very thin features, so up to 130 nanometers or so wide, and not just in one dimension, or sorry, not just in, in the plane of, of the printing, but also along the depth direction. So we get these 3D features in different depths in the resist material, and you can make these 3D structures using the, using, using the nanoscale features. So in, before we actually go into how we got there, let me just go into the background of two-photon lithography, and then we're, we're going to come back to this plot in terms of how did we actually achieve high throughput. So moving on to the background of two-photon lithography and why do we actually call this two-photon lithography. So if, if you look at these two images on the screen, the image on the left is single photon absorption, whereas the image on the right is two-photon absorption. And the material is the same. We have the same lens, but what we are changing is the laser and the illumination conditions. And what you would see between these two images is in single photon absorption, a lot more material is absorbing the light, whereas light is absorbed in a very small region on the right side, the two photon absorption more. And just this observation tells us that if you want to do 3D printing using two photon absorption, we will have very small feature sizes. And the reason why we get this kind of difference in absorption goes back to the physics of the process. So if you take a material, conventional material, hit it with light, what generally happens is if you hit it with light of the right wavelength, a electron from a lower energy level will jump to a higher energy level. But if you don't have the right photons, photons of the right wavelength in the light, that jump will not happen and the material does not absorb that light. But if you have the special condition where light has exactly half the energy in each photon and two photons hit simultaneously, the material can actually absorb those two to make the same jump. And that is what two photon absorption is. And if you can create those conditions with light illumination, what happens is the dosage or the amount of material that's being absorbed is going to be proportional to square of intensity. And what we get is this absorption in a very small region. And there's a second aspect to this, which is the material actually absorbs very little light in the two photon mode. That's because absorbing two photons simultaneously is probabilistically not a very common event. And what this means is you need very high light intensities to actually get any absorption. So these two in combination now tell us that if you use high intensity laser, for example, say femtosecond lasers, and if you focus it into a very small spot where the intensity is very high, but it's very low everywhere else, you'll get this very small spot where light is being absorbed. And from a perspective of 3D printing, what this means is if I'm looking at the distribution 
of amount of light absorbed in the single photon mode, the blue curve, versus two photon mode, the red curve, you get much higher gradients in absorption for the two photon mode. And that gives us this very small width or sub diffraction printing. Now, this background has been out there for 20 years. And a lot of people have actually used this technique to make these 3D structures with very small features. What you need is a laser beam, which is focused to a very small spot, and you need to scan it in space to get out 3D structures. And because of the two photon absorption mode, we can print within the interior of resist. We can make 3D structures layer at a time. And each of these features is going to be smaller than the light spot. And each of these features is very commonly called a voxel or volumetric pixel, because we can actually register or print each voxel individually, which is smaller than the light spot. Okay, so we have a technique to do that. Commercial tools are out there for this process. And I'm showing the manufacturing process overview for the serial process, point by point writing. And it's this manufacturing overview is very similar to what you would see for any other additive manufacturing technique. You would start with the solid model of the part, the structure that you want to print. Then using a software computer aided manufacturing tool, you would convert that into a series of tool parts, then print. And when, when we are printing, we're controlling the laser power and the exposure, the time it takes. Sorry, the time the laser is switched on. And once printing is complete, we would develop this by dissolving the material, the photopolymer, which has not been exposed. And we are left with a structure that we can look at through several different inspection techniques to figure out whether the part that you printed is what you wanted. And in here, we show two examples of that. We could use the traditional nano inspection techniques like scanning electron microscope, or you could use some of the emerging ones like a nanoscale X-ray computer tomography used here. That shows internal details and you can then compare with specifications. So all of this does exist out there in a commercial package. You can buy the system and then start printing structures. The issue is this is very, very slow. And that's what we have been spending most of our time in terms of how do you actually scale up the process. Let me show you a quick video that captures the overall difference between the two techniques. So this is a serial technique where we would take a laser beam, focus it into a small spot, and then start scanning the spot. And the features are very small, so making large structures takes a lot of time. What we did in our technique is instead of a single point, we actually project an entire plane simultaneously. So the image on the top is actually the projection that's happening in, the, in our system. And we show through this video, what we are showing is the major difference between this and other projection techniques is we can actually project it in a plane which is away from the substrate and add a unique or controllable depth along the projection direction. So what that means is we can actually start making 3D structures by projecting planes at a particular depth and simply scan the position of the laser or the material relative to the laser to stack up 3D structures. And if you look at the difference between this technique versus what others have done in the past, a lot of people tried our projection with two photon lithography where they failed is as soon as you project a single layer, the entire material along the depth of the resist material polymerizes. So we are left with a 2D structure instead of a single plane, and there is no way to make a 3D structure with different layers if we have this kind of printing. So on the right is our work, where what we did is we project a single plane, and that plane polymerizes material in a very thin layer without polymerizing anything above or below it. So we can make these suspended layers. We could stack up these layers and make 3D structures. We printed several different kind of structures in here. The image on the top left are some of the thinnest nanowires that we printed. And again, all of this printing, all of the wires in the same plane were printed simultaneously within less than 10 milliseconds. We also printed very large structures, millimeter scale, 
And what used to take several days now takes about an hour or so to print. And also print these very long overhanging bridges, something that's very challenging to print with other 3D printing techniques. But because of the process of printing, because we're printing so fast, there's not enough motion of the resist. So we can print these very long overhanging structures with nanoscale features or features on the 100 nanometer to several hundred nanometer scale. And we also print, we can also print those architectured materials. All you need to do is change the image that you're projecting. And we can also project not just square grid patterns, but arbitrary curved structures to make all of this plane in a single projection. Again, the plane that you're seeing of the spirals is a large plane that was projected in less than 10 milliseconds. So fairly quick printing and printing of arbitrary complex structures is possible. And what lies underneath all of this is we do this scaling or parallelization using the projection mechanism using a digital mask. So a digital micrometer device, that's our digital mask in the system. That device is very commonly used in overhead projectors to actually generate the image that you see during projection of images on a overhead projector. We took the same device out, and what we do is use that to create an imaged femtosecond light sheet or imaged femtosecond beam. And we would focus this beam into a resist material, and the beam is focused into a, uh, into a single layer, thin layer, where polymerization happens. If you want to create 3D structure, we simply change the image, load it onto the DMD. And the image is in the form of a bitmap image. So the two images that you see here are representative of what you would need to create the printed structure. And we project an image, move the stage up, project the next image for the next layer and can stack up and build out 3D structure. Now, just looking at this overall scheme, what you could see is similarities with optical 3D printing, where projection is used to, uh, to create 3D structures in stereolithography. Where there's a, diff there's a major difference between this technique and optical 3D printing or projection stereolithography is really the focusing aspect, which is being able to get those very thin light sheets. And the way we get that is by doing time domain focusing. But traditionally, focusing is done by spatial, in the spatial domain. You take a beam and you narrow the beam to get very high intensities, and that's your focusing effect. Instead, what we do is we said that let's try out this time-based focusing and this technique has been out there in the imaging world for about 10 years and was not quite used for printing applications. And we said we can use the same technique here in printing. What we do is we take a light, a pulse laser beam and change the duration of the pulse. So the pulse exists on a very short time scale of less than 100 femtoseconds. What we can do is as the pulse moves through the material, we would stretch the pulse out in the time domain. So when we stretch a pulse, the total energy remains the same, but the intensity drops, which is the, the power per unit time. And as this pulse moves through the material, we're going to compress the pulse and then stretch it again. So if you're able to do the stretching and compression of pulse as the pulse moves through the material, we get an intensity increase or intensity peak at the focal plane or the print plane and low intensity everywhere else. So that's what is time domain focusing, and that's what enables us to get this very thin light sheet, but the intensity is high, but everywhere else along the depth direction, the intensity is low. And the image on the left actually shows this difference between spatial focusing, so what is done traditionally for single point focusing versus temporal focusing, what we did for the light sheet projection. And in spatial focus thing, you would actually change the beam size. We don't do that. We change the time domain, length of the pulse, and shorten the pulse. The, the way we actually implement is what gets us the ability to make very thin features. 
And how we implement temporal focusing is actually taking advantage of the DMD or the digital mask. The digital mask is a, is a device which has a bunch of micro mirrors which are arranged in a periodic fashion. So anything, any micro mirror arranged in a periodic fashion will act as a grating or a diffraction grating. And within the field of this femtosecond lasers, this concept of stretching and compression of pulses has been out there for several decades. But what we did is we said, let's use the DMD for stretching while it's also projecting the image or creating the intensity, intensity pattern on the beam. And the DMD is going to stretch the beam because different wavelengths of light are going to move at different spots in space. And if we can collect all of these spots, sorry, all of these beams of different wavelengths and focus all of them at the same spot, we can actually get this kind of stretching and compression effect that we are talking about. And we get that by making sure that the DMD plane is imaged onto the resist plane through a series of two mirrors. And we can discuss more about this later in the question answer, answer session. What this means from a perspective of setting up the system is you have two lenses that are imaging a DMD onto a plane. And once you're able to set up this system, what you would get is the light shade intensity distribution is very much restricted to the focal plane. So we did this uh, analysis or, or simulation of optical projection. The image on the top is a bitmap image. So it's a zero one image or a black and white image. And that's loaded onto the DMD. One, once that image or the BMD, sorry, once the laser beam hits the DMD and moves through the optical system, we get projection shown below. Okay, so this is the light intensity distribution on the on the resist in sorry in the resist on the focal plane. Okay, so our projection looks very similar to the projected image. At the same time, the significance of this projection is if you look at the z x axis, so if you look at a cross section along the depth axis, we see that the intensity is high only at the focal plane and the intensity drops down to zero away from the focal plane. So this is the key effect that we want. If we can get this effect, then writing becomes possible only in the focal plane and nowhere else. And that's what got us this ability to project light sheets without polymerizing anything above or below it. We actually tested this out. We projected these images with different input parameters. So from a manufacturing perspective, our goal here was to verify that can we actually control the feature size through certain input parameters. And the relevant input parameters are the exposure time, the time for which you switch on the laser, the power of the laser, and the width of the lines that we are projecting. And what we observed, although this plot looks very, very messy, if we separate out all the parameters, what you would observe is this set of observations match our expectation in terms of exposure, power, and thickness. So if you expose it for longer, you get thicker and wider lines. If you have higher power beams, you get thicker and wider lines. And if you project thicker lines, the digital image itself is thicker. It, it creates or fabricates lines which are thicker, both thicker and wider. So we haven't spent a lot of time actually and generating models on the process, but that is an ongoing work in terms of analyzing how do you predict this uh, input-output relationship for the process. And one key thing I want to convey in here in terms of scaling up is if you project a very large image instead of a single point, we can scale up by a thousand times because we are parallelizing it. But the question is, is do you need very large lasers to be able to do that? Do you just need a bigger laser with more energy? And the answer to that is not, not necessarily larger laser, but a different kind of laser. And what we learned about this process is if you're scaling it from a serial single point writing to a projection of light sheet, what remains invariant across the two is the intensity. 
It's not the energy that needs to be invariant. It's not the fluence or energy per unit area that needs to be invariant. What is invariant is intensity, the power per unit time. And we have a lot of control knobs from a laser perspective in terms of changing the intensity while still being able to get very large area, projection of large areas. And what we did is we use commercial lasers, which are low repetition rate lasers, instead of the, of the energy being distributed across many pulses, the energy is distributed across a smaller number of pulses, but you'd still get this high intensity over the entire region. Okay. So this actually enabled us to scale up without having to reinvent the laser system. And moving on to some other topics, which actually helped us get to a point where we have very high throughput printing, are two of the things, materials and process knowledge. So looking at materials in this field, oftentimes go back a step. So in this field, a lot of times we would see, if you read the papers for two foot on lithography, is everyone is making their own resists. Very few commercial resists are available. And the reason for that is making commercial resists is challenging because you have to satisfy several requirements. And if you look at the resist, the photoresist material is made up of the traditional fun functional elements that you would see in other optical 3D printing techniques. There's a photo initiator that absorbs light, and you have pre-polymers or the monomer blocks that link with each other to make the cross-linked polymer, the end product, and you could add certain elements, uh, compounds in there to enhance properties, and you have inhibitors to stop reactions. So most of it, except for the photo initiator, is similar to what you would see for single photon chemistry, but then we have this unique two photon physics. If done right, we'll get you the excuse me, we'll get you the high radical concentrations. Radicals are what generates or starts the chemical reactions necessary for printing. The major difference between polymerization here and in optical 3D printing would be the short time scales, because what we are doing is printing on the millisecond time scales for each layer and also smaller length scales on the order of a micron to 10 micron at most. In terms of making custom two for down resists, the key things that we need to satisfy are the high two for down absorptivity, are the photo initiators of high absorptivity or enough absorptivity to generate the reactions, we also need the resist to be optically clear so that the light can penetrate into the in, through the material to the focal plane. We did a lot of printing with custom resist and what we found, we also need to make sure that these structures actually stand up. They have enough strength after development to be able to make 3D structures. Not all resists will have the strength. Then there is this issue of index matching of the resist and we need the chemistry be fast enough. For certain chemistries, the reactions are not fast enough and you won't be able to print it in the two for down mode. So instead of going through all of these, I'm going to focus on just one aspect, which has been a critical aspect for us to be able to make these large millimeter scale structures and take advantage of throughput. So one of the issues we saw early on with this material, sorry, with this process is the resist material has to have a refractive index matched to that of the immersion medium of the lens. These lenses that we use are high numerical aperture lenses, and if you dip them into the material, into the resist material, you need to make sure the index is matched to the immersion. If not, we get aberrations. And what aberrations do is they spread out the focus beam, or sorry, the focus part, and create larger features than you would want. So the focusing becomes challenging, focusing into a small spot. And if we can actually get an index mash resist, we can actually make millimeter scale structures. And the reason for that is you would directly dip the lens into the resist and simply build in a direction where you're moving away from the substrate. So there is just no limitation on the height anymore. What is traditionally being done 
in the field is in the field of two for down lithography is let's not worry about refractive index matching. Let's just work with any material we want. And what we will do is sandwich the substrate between the resist and uh, sorry, the, we'll add oil between the substrate and the lens, immersion oil. So if you just look at the leftmost image, that will still give you printing that reduces the amount of, that reduces the distance over which light goes to the photoresist material, but eventually the lens is going to hit the substrate. And that limits the height of the features or the structures to about 100 micron or so. If you review this field, what you would see is a lot of different materials are out there for two for down lithography, but not a lot of materials are out there for making 3D structures of millimeter scale heights. And we wanted to make sure we actually have this ability to be able to take advantage of the height throughput. And what we did is we spent our time looking at how do you actually make index match resist? It's pretty straightforward if you know the technique. And the way you do that is by mixing monomers of different or uh, different refractive index until you get an effective index of 1.52. And once you do that, what we are able to do is focus light into a very, very small spot or diffraction limited spot. That's the name for that kind of condition. And instead of getting thick spots, we get very thin spots. And we have actually been able to take advantage of this to make materials which have different functional properties. So in here, we actually tuned the extra absorptivity, but at the same time, they were index matched and we made these multi-material structures by tuning the components of the resist. Now, this kind of index matched resist was critical for us to get those long or tall structures. Now moving on to a different aspect is what kind of process knowledge do we need to take advantage of the height stripper? Or does height throughput get us to a point where other metrics are being hurt? So we looked, started looking at this high height throughput regime or relatively high in the serial process itself. And what we had observed through our own experiments is that the defects seem to be very random or there is no determinism. And once we started looking internally into these materials, we saw that these defects were actually deterministic, but they were based on the architecture or density of the materials. And what we learned through this process is if you want to make 3D structures, you'll need to calibrate your process not only for the material, but also the structure that you're printing. So that was a major new learning that actually pushed, it, pushed us to a point where we can make defect-free structures with in in structures with a heterogeneous where the density changes over the entire structure the second kind of information that we were interested in is actually looking at the process processing property relationship is we are interested in making structures of a particular size but also a particular material property and the dominant approach in this field was let's make a 3d structure out of the material and then we are going to look at the material, sorry, look at the mechanical response. We're going to compress the 3D structure and try to get the Young's modulus and strength. The problem with that is that approach makes a lot of assumptions about how do you link the structural response to the material response. And what we said is let's look at the material response on the nanoscale. We developed these MEM sensors or micro scale sensors. This was done in collaboration with the team at uh, University of Texas, Austin. We were able to print the single voxel lines or the smallest line possible and then stretch these lines. And what we learned about the process is you could make the same geometry through several different process conditions, but depending on which process condition you chose, you would get material properties which are different from each other. So all of these curves, the four curves, are for the same geometry. So nominally 370 nanometer white lines. But if you write at high speed or high throughput conditions, what we saw 
is that the strength of the material and the stiffness was much, much lower than what you would get at low speeds. And the significance of this is in additive manufacturing, it's very commonly said that you get materials, you create materials and geometry at the same time. What we learn is that you can create geometry and materials and can decouple the two where you can get geometry, same geometry, but different material properties through selection of your processing conditions. Again, this was critical for us in terms of getting high strength materials that don't collapse when we are printing at very high speeds. So in the remaining time, what I'm going to do is close out with some open questions in two for down the tower is we have this process which is fast enough. We know sufficiently enough to a point where we can make 3D structures, but where do we go with this in terms of manufacturing process? And in manufacturing, a key requirement for any process to be used is, can we predictively make structures to specifications? So you have your needs, specifications, you make a structure and compare the two. And if, if, if the structure meets the specifications, that's a successful fabrication process or fabrication run. Now in two for non-lithography, the state of art is this is a very iterative process. What we do is we guess the initial inputs, we would print, compare. If the comparison tells us it's not the right, right structure, we would make another guess and keep doing this iteratively. So that's how we printed our structures for high throughput case. That's how the rest of the community prints the structure. What we would like to do is actually get to a deterministic process where if you have your specifications that if run through in vertical models will tell you what the inputs could be or should be, and then you run your parts and print them to specification. So that's a goal that a lot of research communities in IIT manufacturing are looking at. In terms of two photon lithography, where we have, uh, where we don't have this ability, it's really these invertible models or knowledge gaps about the process. And you see, so in terms of knowledge gaps, if we look at the way the techniques have been developed in this field, in throughput, we have been doing pretty good over time. There have been three generations of development in this process. The first generation was pretty slow. The next generation, we got a thousand times increase. And the most recent generation where we parallelized the process, again, gave us a thousand time increase in the throughput. But at the same time, there has been this trade-off of process knowledge. We have been learning less and less about the process conditions that generate a particular part. And what we would like to do is move up to a point where we are not only doing very high throughput printing, something we can do today, but also predictively print the structures to specifications. And I don't have the answers for that right now. That's something we are working on. But the questions that we do need to answer are some of these questions in here, which is, is there a generalizable threshold law? For example, we get printing when certain conditions hit a particular threshold, but do those relationships stay the same for different structures or different materials? And what kind of properties do we need to know to be able to predict those relationships? The second is about dosage accumulation and decay, which is if I exposed a certain region but did not actually get printing, what happens when I expose it, expose the same region again? Does the region go back to the original conditions or is there some permanent change in that region of the photopolymer? Then there's this question of index mismatch in resist. We can solve the problem of index matching for certain materials, but not for all materials. So is there a way we can compensate for index mismatch based errors to a point that we can get very small features in all of the index mismatch materials? And the question of interfaces is if you are printing multiple materials or even the same materials, you would generally make 3D structures by stitching together the different projections. What happens at the interfaces? Are those weak? Can we actually have seamless interfaces? where we don't actually see an interface or cannot distinguish an interface from the rest of the material. So those are questions we need to answer, which haven't yet been answered 
that if answered, will convert this process from a lab-based technique to a manufacturing process. Now, I'm going to conclude with that, which is we do have this ability to print 3D structures very fast, but we don't understand the process well enough to a point that we can predictively start making functional 3D structures. It takes a lot of time to iter iteratively come up with the input parameters to get us the 3D structure. And before I stop, I would like to thank my collaborators, Professor Chen from Hong Kong, uh, Dr. Nguyen and Oakdale from Lawrence Livermore National Lab. And a lot of this work was funded by the by DOE LDRD funding. And thank you all for 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 your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Saha. I really appreciate your your time and and giving this wonderful presentation. Uh, we do have um, I do want to thank the audience as well. We do have some questions from the audience. Um, okay. First question is uh, for two D projection printing. How did the hanging bridge support itself without a post during the printing? Was there special mechanical design? Yeah, and that's a very interesting question. And I think I primed you for that question by showing a section. So let me actually go back to the images. So the short answer is we did have a post and we did have a post on both ends. So if you look at this image, there are posts at these two ends and the 2D projections are actually hanging by being attached to those two posts. The critical factor in here was being able to print these 2D projections without sinking them or floating them away while the other ones are being printed. And we can do that by actually printing so fast that the fluid is not moving fast enough to move the each, each 2D projection away. So how fast is that entire structure printed? So each projection is about 10 milliseconds and to move you need 10 milliseconds and I think there are about 10 projections. There are less than a second to make that bridge and about a second for each of the pillars. So this is less than five to 10 seconds. Fascinating. <clears throat> All right, we have another question. Um, how do you monitor the mechanical properties of the constructs when the throughput of manufacturing is increased? Do you have a strategy to conduct high throughput mechanical characterization of the manufactured pieces made using this process? So, no, we don't have a strategy for high throughput characterization. And what we do is we still do this offline characterizations where we would take the structure and do traditional mechanical testing on that. So for single uh, lines or single nanowires, we can put it on these MEMS tensile testers. For large 3D structures, millimeter scale, we can put it on say an Instron machine. So it's again, at this point, we don't necessarily need high throughput testing, but that would be helpful having the strategy for high throughput testing and testing our materials and processing conditions. Another question. How was your research lab's work delayed this spring with coronavirus restrictions and with water main break near your building? Did you lose any resist material with loss of air conditioning? Actually, so I started last fall. The day I was supposed to actually start my work is when coronavirus hit the lockdown. So most of the work that we have been doing in lab started after the after we were allowed to get in. So no, I did not lose any resist. I would probably have lost the resist if I had something in the lab. And most of this work that I showed today is from before I started at the lab, uh, sorry, at Georgia Tech. So I have a question, uh, Dr. Saha. Um, um, actually, I was wondering, so all of these structures you're showing, are these all polymer materials? And are you able to uh, get other materials like metals, metal oxides? 
So the materials that I've shown today are all polymer materials. We are working on other materials, uh, for example, ceramics. And the way to make ceramics using this technique is you would start with the pre-ceramic polymer material. So the polymer material has certain elements, say silicon in it, and you would burn everything except silicon and oxygen. And so you're left with silicon, sorry, silicon, oxygen, carbon, silico oxycarbide ceramics. So that is something we are working on. The next is metals. So we have actually demonstrated printing of metals using the same light source, the same technique, the same hardware, but the physics is somewhat different and that's two photon reduction. The challenge with metals has been that metals tend to sink as you're printing if, if you don't have a substrate. So we can make 2D structures, but not 3D structures. And we are hoping that with, so that was all done with serial point by point writing. We are hoping with the projection, we can actually print 3D structures because we print them while structures are all attached to certain, to some base. Great, great. Okay. Uh, we had a couple more questions come in. Do you have any plans to coat printed parts with evaporated metal or other material for enhanced material properties? And yeah, then so I, think the, I think the next question is similar. It's about what kind of composite materials would work well with this technology. Okay, so let me go back to the first one, which is, and to give you just a background, my focus is on manufacturing of the manufacturing metrics of the processes, actually improving the the rate through predictability quality. From a materials perspective, there are several groups out there who are actually taking what we print and will coat it with other materials. So with metals and deposit, say, uh, metal oxide, and then convert that into a different structure by burning of the polymer. So what you're left with is, say, a metal rod with a hollow in it or a metal oxide rod with a hollow in it. And those are very much application specific, which is, do you need this material? I coat it. And the coating processes are again, have been out there. Uh, ARD is very commonly used. The challenge is getting materials to all sections if the porosity is very small. So getting materials into dense structures. Uh, the second question was composites. So this process of converting a liquid photopolymer to a solid cured structure, that works for polymer materials or any material which has reactive polymer units. Now into that polymer backbone, you can put other elements into the backbone and that other element will then show up in your final uh, voxel. And we have done some of that where we added iodine into the backbone of the polymer other teams have added nickel into the backbone of polymer. And what you're left with is polymer, carbon-based material with iodine or carbon-based material with metal. And you can then burn off some of the carbon to be left with some mixture of carbon or nickel or just nickel or just iodine. So that's the strategy you would do, which is print with polymer-based technique and then post-process to get the material that you want. Can, can you speak on, because I know you, you did an excellent job of just covering the fundamentals of the process, um, you know, and, and giving us background on the optical techniques as well. But could you speak a little bit about the uh, exciting applications for this technology? Yes, yeah, some of those. So if we actually let me just tell you some of the things we are very much interested in is. Uh, batteries and electrochemical devices is instead of these 2D layers in batteries, can we actually have 3D batteries? So 3D stacking that gives us very high density, both energy and power, power because we can make very small features. So can we have wearable uh, devices with 3D printed batteries or other applications, for example, say drones, where the power density is going to be important. The other application space is optics or micro optics. So one of the examples you saw is putting a microscope on top of an optical fiber, and you can then make endoscopes 
with very high uh, feature resolution if you have very good optical microscope or compound lenses. Some of the optics applications we are looking at diffraction optics, which is our diffractive optical elements is, uh, you may have heard of meta material op uh, meta materials for optics, where you have planar optics, but that would act as a lens. So some of the ways we would do that is by using these very small features on the 3D, 3D features, but on very small scale, on the scale of the wavelength of light or smaller. Then there are applications for actually 3D optical structures, which are a little bit bigger than wavelength of light for transmitting light across quantum devices. So if you have optics-based quantum devices and you want to transfer information across two devices, you would use optical interconnects. So very similar to electrical interconnects, but using optics. And these polymers are very, very good in terms of transmitting optical information from one part to other. If we have 3D structures, we can do this kind of networked optical interconnects in a very small compact space. And there are not a lot of good ways of doing that today, 3D interconnects for optics. The other application, which a lot of people talk about, but we are not quite there, is materials, metamaterials. Can I actually make airplane wings using this technique? And the advantage of doing that is the strength of the material is going to be very high because of the small features. And if I can make large structures, I can, especially in high performance applications, I could replace those materials, structural materials with something like this that would give me an advantage in terms of the weight. So these are very light materials, but strong and stiff as much as um, theoretical limit of glass. I think those are the major applications. Then in the biomedical field, a lot of people are working on making micro structures that can go inside the human body with biocompatible polymers for small features. So some of the examples you saw are micro needles. You could make walls that can actually go inside uh, blood vessels. And you could also send drug delivery systems with drug encased on this small scale. Again, we need high throughput production to be able to do that on, on an effective scale. Yeah, those are the ones I can think of right now. Excellent, excellent. Um, very, very entertaining. and. Uh, talk that you've given here. Um, I can tell this research has a very bright future. So, thank you, thank you very much again, uh, Dr. Saha, uh, for your presentation. You. Um, yeah, I do want to remind everybody that this um, lecture is recorded. Um, so if, if you go to our website, manufacturing.gotech.edu slash lectures, um, the, the recording should, there's a link to the recording that should be there in a few days. Um, so again, I um, want to thank everybody. Uh, actually, next next week we will have uh, Professor Chip White. He's going to talk about the impact of uh, COVID-19 on manufacturing supply chain design and operations. Uh, more from an academic standpoint, he's a professor uh, at ISYE at Georgia Tech. Um, and then actually the week after that, we'll have more of an industrial perspective on, on the effect of uh, COVID on supply chain. Um, so uh, with that, I don't see any further questions. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna wrap up um, and and close out the talk. So thank you guys for participating, um, and I wish that you spread the word about our series, invite others to attend, and we'll be here again next week. Thank you very much. <laughs>